Greetings everyone, Brett here with Hammerhead Model Making, back with another full build video. Today we are going to be tackling Academy's 148 scale CH-53E. This is a large kit, and this is going to be a long video. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping items here. There are a number of sections that I've done, uh, like time lapse. Um, I think this will help better show techniques in their entirety, as opposed to me breaking it up and different editing chunks. So um, if there are areas that you're not interested in, go ahead and skip forward from those areas. But um, uh, other than that, we're, uh, yeah, we'll just go ahead and get started. This is, this is a uh, out of production kit that is, it is un some, somewhat difficult to find these days. This is actually a commission build. So the client sent me the kit um, and uh, kind of one of those things that I probably wouldn't have chosen to build on my own. But now that I've built it, um, I'm really glad I, I got the opportunity to build it because it's a, it's actually a really good kit, um, and I got to learn a lot about the CH53 and and uh, kind of some unique things about it. So uh, this was a good just overall experience for me, and I really enjoyed it. Um, like most aircraft type builds, it starts all on, on the interior with the cockpit. Uh, you are supplied with a, a decent cockpit. I mean, it's got nice raised detail for the instrument panels and um, the seats and, and you get your your uh, all your control apparatuses um, so it's it's rather nice uh, somewhat simplified but still I mean I think all the basics are there um, you could certainly go to town detailing this I know that Edward makes uh, a number of detail sets for this kit uh, and I'm sure there are other aftermarket items as well. So you could go to town detailing this. Uh, this will be an out-of-the-box build. Um, and uh, I think you'll enjoy the results. So we can go ahead and kind of get a lot of the, the interior parts built up. This, this part here uh, is what holds the main rotor mast um, and allows it to spin freely if that is something that you... Uh, that is important to you. Otherwise, you can just all, you know lock it all down and glue your rotor in. Um, but being that this is going to be a commission build, I will have to ship it, so I just need it removable. Uh, there are a number of holes that need to be drilled in the fuselage, and one whole page of the instructions is dedicated to basically pointing out where all of these holes are. Um, so you really have to be careful that you're getting all the right ones open. And, uh, you know, I, I'm even here double checking like, okay, if I open this hole, what part goes there, that kind of a thing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, just, just really take your time, make sure that you're opening all the correct ones because there's different holes to open, depending if you're doing the, uh, rotor blades, rotor blades stowed or deployed. Uh, you also have to open up these like rectangular holes to accept the side sponson areas. Um, so again, you just you, you really got to be making sure you're double checking every single thing that you need to open up on this kit uh, so that you're not kind of uh, hampering yourself later on in the build when it comes time to adding details to the fuselage. So um, keep working on the interior. It, it does come with a fully boxed in uh, cargo troop area. Uh, the detail is, I mean, it's there. It's nice. It's, you got this quilted pattern, you know, this quilted material, like the soundproofing material on the inside of the cabin. Pretty decent. Uh, it is littered with ejection pin markings. Um, so if if you plan to really have this open and, and full on display, uh, you might need to take care of those. Um, one thing I wanted to be able to practice on this kit with was doing a lot of fun uh leather or uh, layering with uh paint chipping um and uh because the the floors on these things especially on deployment really got beat up and um so i think what you'll see is uh going forward is just kind of a, a neat process for creating these multi layers of chipping um so everything gets a, a nice coat of um uh, gloss black uh using uh, Alclad lacquer. Uh, doing this because I do plan on laying down the first coat's going to be a, a metallic layer. And uh, so just wanted to make sure I had a nice shiny surface to go down on. And based off, off of my off, off my last, bit, last build, the uh, Fury, I really liked this primer. So uh, I just I just ended up using it for the whole for the entire interior, even though not all of it was going to get painted in the uh, in the metallic. So here we're using Vallejo aluminum. Uh, and this is just really going down on all of the um, surfaces where 
people would be walking and, and, you know, cargo would be loaded on or whatnot, basically anywhere that it would damage uh, from wear and tear. And uh, so just kind of lay this on in a couple thin coats. I did end up laying it down a little too heavy on that back ramp portion that you saw just a second ago. Um, so just be aware. Uh, the, the, the Vallejo paints really want to be like a few thin layers. Um, but once you build it up, it, it really turns out quite nice. So here we go, uh, just finishing up with the Vallejo aluminum. Um, I did use the just uh, like matte aluminum for this. Uh, I, I didn't need like a mirror finish on this just because I, I would be weathering over it. So just be aware of that. Uh, while that's drying, we can hit the side panels with the interior gray color. Um, you really can, uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier with the cockpit, you could really go into town detailing this and adding a bunch of uh, the wires and cables that would be running alongside the uh, the inside of the aircraft here. Um, I have seen pictures of the CH-53s without the soundproofing material, and, there's, and it's just, you know, you have the, all the exposed ribs and, and all the wires and cabling and everything that goes back, and it could be, could be a fun, you know, super detailing project, but out of the box, it still gives you enough. All right, so we're gonna lay on a layer of chipping fluid. Uh, this is the heavy chipping fluid. It kind of goes on kind of like a kind of speckly, I would say, uh, but I believe this is by design. This this helps with the chipping process. It, it does appear to have like a texture to it, but once you lay the next color over it, there is no texture, so just be aware. It does go on flat. So now we're gonna do some uh, in this uh, primer yellow. Uh, so this just gets painted over everything that we just already painted over. Um, and uh, lay it on in a nice even coat. Uh, you could, if you didn't necessarily want to paint the entire thing and you know you knew specifically where you wanted to chip, you could just paint it in those specific areas. You don't have to cover the whole thing. Um, but I was going to be, I, I was really going to be chipping basically this most of this deck. So uh, I just decided to paint the whole thing. That way just all the subsequent layers are all going over the same previous layer and it all has the same base. Um, so now the chipping process begins by adding a little bit of water to the area that you want to chip. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the product or you haven't used this product before, I recommend just doing small areas at first. Once you kind of get the hang of it, then you can do larger areas. But you let the water activate, usually about 30 seconds, and then you can start um, hitting it with kind of a, I'm using just using this old stiff brush, and you can see there it's already starting to pull up some of that primer yellow color, and you can see that exposed metallic color, color underneath. So you just kind of keep moving forward and and uh, <clears throat> pretty straightforward. The uh, the chipping process I, I do enjoy doing this, although it, it sometimes it can be hard to control. Um, but I I like the randomness and the kind of the the sense of um, because I don't have full control, it, it things happen that I wasn't necessarily expecting to happen or intending. And sometimes you get those you know as Bob Ross would say, you get those happy little accidents. Um, so here I'm just really concentrating on the raised surfaces and the recesses where they would have all the tie down parts, um, you know, where they'd be tying down cargo and whatnot. So, and then I'll go back in and kind of just do the general wear and stuff, but that's really what I'm concentrating on here. Um, so it's got these, these kind of these two tracks along the whole thing where, where cargo pallets would be loaded up onto. So I really want to make sure those were nice and scuffed up. And, uh, I did the same thing on the actual cargo door ramp. So. Now we're going to do one more layer of the heavy chipping fluid. Once, uh, so and just and just to point out, I've I've allowed probably about a good twelve hours to for the the previous layer to dry before doing the next layer. Uh, that way, you're just not like reactivating two layers deep, um, even though sometimes it it does happen. So now we're just doing on a layer of NATO black. Um, this will be our final layer, but it will be chipped as well. Um, try and keep mental note of where you have already done chipping, so that way as you're, as you're doing the next layer of chipping, you, you're, you're exposing those both layers of uh, the, both the primer yellow and the metallic. Um, but everything gets a coat of NATO black, and, and it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of disconcerting at first because you're covering all that cool chipping. You're like, wait, I just did all that hard work and now I'm painting over it, but I promise you it's worth it in the end. Um, so once again, we put a little water on to activate and uh, let that soak in a bit, and then we can start attacking it with the, uh, the stiff brush, and, and it'll start pulling up some of that black color. Um, and so you could really kind of push this as far as as much as you wanted to I and mean, you could really really destroy 
the the uh, the surface that you're working on, um, or or you could just just do it lightly. It's it's kind of up to you. Um, but I do I do like the MIG product. It seems to work well with um, pretty much all acrylics that I've used so far. So Tamiya, uh, Vallejo, MIG, they all seem to work really well with the chipping fluid. So um, there you go. But yeah, here's our here's kind of our final um, chipping layer, and so you'll see the results here in a minute. So what we can do now is uh, one of the fun things about doing this interior was that there were multiple shades of gray going into um, into the interior, which kind of helps break up some of these really large flat sections, um, and uh, just kind of create different variations. So we had the uh, soundproofing material was a slightly different color gray. And then there's this large uh, center panel on the roof that will be a slightly different color gray. Um, so just kind of adds some variation to, to the interior and just kind of helps break it up a little bit. Um, so now with all the chipping done, we can go ahead and do some detail painting in the cockpit. The, uh, the NATO black that I used for the floor really is more like a really dark gray. So it's not like a good pure black. Um, and so in order to create a little bit of contrast in the cockpit, I'm using a pure black to do the, the instruments and the instrument consoles and things like that, just to help, again, break up what would be a monotonous color tone. Uh, so we're just doing all the, you know, the, th the throttles and the, uh, cyclic and collective and all that stuff. Um, and there's these circuit breaker panels on, actually, I believe that's what they are, um, back behind the cockpit and, uh, get those all painted up. So this is all just being brush painted with Vallejo paints, uh, getting some buttons on the control sticks here um, with red, and then uh, we can work on the instrument panel. So the kit does provide a decal for the instrument panel, although the detail on the instrument panel is raised. So if you chose, if you wanted to hand paint it, you certainly could. Um, I just don't have the skills to hand paint a nice um, instrument panel like that. So I will be using the, uh, the decal. Um, and truth be told, once once everything is all closed up, you, you really don't see much. Um, th there is a lot of glass in the cockpit, but it's also because everything is just black in there. It just becomes really dark and difficult to see. Um, I had a uh, viewer send me some of these custom-made hammerhead decals. Uh, so I will hide one inside the aircraft here. Um, I mean, once it's, once it's closed up, you'll never see it again, but you all know it's there. Video proof. Um, we can go ahead and seal all of our interior work with a layer of gloss. Uh, this will prepare everything for some weathering. Um, again, we're kind of going for a CH-53 that's been out on deployment for a while. So it's going to be a little dirty. And uh, so that means panel washes and some oil painting. Um, and for this, I'm going to forego my normal washes uh, and use a really thinned oil wash. Um, just because this thing is just so big, um, I, I'd go through like half a bottle of my normal wash, just doing the interior wash for this thing. So, uh, I just mixed up some oil paint and, and some mineral spirits and we'll do the wash this way, um, using a, a black with a little bit of brown mixed in, uh, I think will provide a good contrast for the detail. And, and there is a fair amount of detail in here that will help, you know, that will pick up that wash and really make it look, really make it pop and uh, look nice so here we're just doing the roof or sorry the ceiling um this is the uh the bulkhead so the back end of the bulkhead between the crew compartment and the and the uh, cockpit uh, and then finally just doing a little bit of wash on the um on the floor i didn't gloss the floor uh mainly just because i wanted to preserve the the metallic sheen um as it was painted uh, so I just, I'm just being a little bit more careful there. And then now I'm going to do kind of a dust wash. So with this, I'm just, I've mixed up a really, really light brown tannish color and I've put on a nice layer of mineral spirits onto the floor. And then I'm just kind of dabbing on the tan oil paint. Um, once the mineral spirits dry and evaporate, it'll leave, it'll kind of leave these splotchy tan marks on there, which hopefully will look kind of like dust and dirt build up in accumulation. Um, imagine this being on deployment uh, in the, you know, in the Middle East or something or, or Afghanistan where it can get 
rather dusty and so I imagine that's how it would that's how it would accumulate and look um, <clears throat> I, I really like using this this oil painting technique uh, I think it I think it works well it's pretty simple I mean you, you can just see I just I literally just put on some mineral spirits and then dabbed on and blended in that um, that oil paint so now we're just gonna hit everything with a matte color or a matte coat seal it all in and uh, that will be just about done with the uh, the interior. Um, what what you need to be careful on is the kind of the order of operations on this kit. Uh, so you have to put these windows in first because they the windows basically get sandwiched sandwiched between the outer hull and the inner cabin walls. And so if you if you don't remember to do them just then then it'll be you'll be really kind of out of luck later on if you if you'd already put the interior parts in um it'll be it would be unfortunate so now we can really kind of start f finish assembling the interior parts here so here we're just doing this bulkhead getting that glued on it was kind of a tight snap to get it in but once it once it was in it was it was pretty solidly locked in there so now we're just basically securing it with a little bit of glue um and uh get out that get that locked in there um, then we can add the pilot seat and the co-pilot seat um, I, I think the uh, like I mentioned before the cockpit is fairly nice um, I, one thing that would be really good as an inclusion with this kit maybe is like even just some decal seat belts uh, because the seats are somewhat prominent uh, but now we can we can uh, finish assembling the, the cabin here. So like I mentioned, this the, the windows get sandwiched between the interior interior bulkhead and the exterior hull. So just be careful there. We can get the instrument panel laid down. Um, uh, additionally, if you wanted to add some additional detail to the cockpit, uh, you can see the back of the cockpit or sorry the back of the instrument panel. Uh, through the windows so if you wanted to add extra detail you could add kind of like the all the cables and wires coming off the back of the instrument panel for all the instruments uh, you would be able to see that so that'd be kind of some neat detail to add in there um, here we got the overhead panel going on uh, this gets attached to the bulkhead as opposed to getting attached to the actual clear part which I prefer just less chances for mishap on the clear part um, get the the assembly in here for the rotor uh, there's very very nice uh, connection points here as well as don't forget to add the exhaust for the third engine into here as well you need to get that added in before you close up the holes um, otherwise it won't fit so just be aware that that needs to go in there and um, finally working up all of the uh, passenger seats in the back uh, so these are multiple parts um, that need to be glued together they were kind of finicky they weren't really good solid connection points um, so you really got to be careful and uh, make sure it's all aligned up um, so I painted them off screen basically just aluminum with some uh, green paint for the actual seat um, and then they get glued to the side walls of the interior um, and uh, again pretty straightforward now there were locating tabs on here that were supposed to fit into slots on the the interior wall portion there uh, but I did miss that step of having to cut out those openings um, so here I'm just kind of eyeballing it hoping I'm getting it in the right place and there's also each side has three and uh, yeah they look pretty good um, client wanted the side the side window open for the door gunners so I added a little bit of masking tape on the inside to protect it during the painting process but also make it somewhat easy to remove them once the painting process was over um here we're starting to assemble with with all of the plastic that went into the interior of this helicopter um i'm actually a, i'm actually surprised how well the two halves of the fuselage fit together um there was almost very little like troublesome seams that i had to deal with i mean there's the normal seams right but for the most part it it just snapped together so kudos to academy this i mean there was a lot of plastic going in there and it all pretty much fit as designed so here we're just adding some tape to uh, help hold things together while i glue it uh, this did require a lot of glue the seam line is very long running along the top 
um, and then two seam lines on the bottom. It does have it. There is a large separate panel that goes on the bottom. Um, and that was a little tricky to get lined up, but for the most part, we got it lined up. Uh, I would say the most troublesome seam on the was this back seam here. Um, that one was kind of hard to get in. But uh, a lot of body panels going on here. Um, the kit does give you the option of having the tail rotor folded. Um, and so there are there are plates that you need to put in there to help both strengthen that area and give it a place to connect. So those will need to go in. So here's that bottom plate I was mentioning. Um, the tail unit is separate because it, again, because it can be folded, uh, which is which is pretty nice. So you can do you can fold both the tail and the main rotor assembly. So you have those options, uh, and I'm always a big fan of options. Um, get the strut put in here. Uh, this all fit together pretty well, so no real issues or complaints here. Um, pretty logical. Main canopy going on. Um, this just required a little bit of pressure to make sure it worked. I used the quick setting glue on this just so I could make sure to get it in place, held in place, and it would it would stay where it needed to go. Um, but otherwise, it was it was a good fit and uh, looks the part. So here we can start, uh, you know, assembling some of the uh, sponson bits. We got the the uh, external fuel tanks, um, the sponsons on the side that contain uh, the wheel wells, and uh, and then the little little bracket for the fuel tank here. So this all goes together, pretty straightforward. Um, again, no real fit issues here, uh, and the detail is fairly good looking, I think. Um, just be sure to follow the instructions and uh, make sure you're getting all the right parts aligned. Also, I'd like to point out, um, I apologize for any of the background noise. The uh, We're getting into the warm months here in Utah, and so my air conditioner will occasionally kick on and it can be kind of noisy. So I apologize. Uh, but moving right along, we just, we get all these parts. So it is basically everything I'm doing here, we have to duplicate for both sides. Um, the fit of these parts is generally pretty good, uh, so the cleanup is not too bad when it comes to having to do um, filling seam lines and that kind of stuff. So, um, and a lot of these parts are on natural seam lines, anyways. So, like for the spons in here, for example, really the only the only seam you have to clean up is the very right front seam there, um, and that's pretty simple to clean up. So, uh, you know, not too bad. Um, building up the rotor head, so. I was a little concerned about this. Uh, if, if you've seen pictures of the CH-53, the CH-53 has a very large rotor head and it is very complex. Um, and Academy's plastic version is pretty good. Uh, from an engineering standpoint, it's brilliant. And the way it all builds up and the way that it all fits together is really nice uh, if you're doing the extended version. If you're doing the folded version, um, then I have some concerns, uh, mainly just because the attachment points become so small for the folded version. And the each rotor blade is really large and quite long. And so there's a lot of, you know, leverage weight going on to some of these attachment points if you're doing the folded version. If you're doing the deployed version, then it's great. It's perfect. And everything works exactly as it should be. So you can see there's, there's a fair amount of parts going into this um, that all get put on. Um, but you could, you could have, you could spend days working on detailing up the rotor head. Uh, you know, the actual CH-53 has just miles of cables and hoses, um, all throughout this, this whole assembly. Uh, so you could have a lot of fun detailing it up, but I think out of the box, it's not terrible. Um, all of the major components are there. The major details are there. And it still kind of gives you that, uh, you know, sense that it's busy. Um, but you really could go to town on this in terms of super detailing. And, and again, it's a very prominent part of the helicopter, especially if you're looking at it from a viewer's perspective. It's, it is on the very top and it's large and it's there. Um, so it could be a good centerpiece if you wanted to go detailing it up. But out of the box, not terrible. Now we can add on the refueling probe. Uh, this just slots in. Not difficult. So now we can start masking everything up, getting prepared for painting. Um, here I'm just using uh, regular masking tape and I'm using a sharpened uh, dowel stick uh, to gently burnish the outside edges 
and then I will come in with a brand new fresh blade on my hobby knife and cut those out. Uh, burnishing the edges first really just kind of helps give your knife uh, a, a guide as to where to cut. Um, so these weren't too difficult. Pretty simple to do. Uh, the main windows, I first outlined them with some Tamiya masking tape, and then I will go in and fill in with just some regular masking tape. Um, and uh, almost, you know, very similar to how it would be done if you'd gotten uh, like a mask set, for example. The um, the demarcation between the window and the, the hull, the framing and everything was, was pretty pronounced, so it was relatively easy to go through and, and mask these up. Um, wasn't a lot of guesswork, so uh, that was uh, that was rather nice. Um, the The more difficult areas are just some of the smaller windows towards the bottom, especially around the refueling probe. Uh, there's some kind of weird shapes there, so just got to be careful. But it's definitely doable. All right, everything was primed in my Rust-Oleum 2X Black Primer, and now we're going to start hitting it with an underlayer of white. Uh, this will kind of just help create some texture. If you look at the actual CH-53s, um, they're, they are just covered and covered in tens of thousands of rivets. Um, and the rivet lines are usually rather pronounced. Um, and since the uh, the kit does have recessed panel lines, but it doesn't go into all of the actual riveting, um, I'm going to try and kind of fudge things a little bit here and, and use some clever painting techniques to kind of help uh, trick the eye into thinking there could be rivet lines there. Um, so one of the things I'm doing here is just using this uh, white undercolor or the undershade to just kind of create some of this this texture um, around the helicopter and uh, give it some some pre shading underneath the main color. So for the main color, I'm going to be using Tamiya's medium gray, and uh, this will go on rather thin because I want some of that pre shading to show through. Uh, so we're just going to do a couple of really thin coats here just to kind of build that up to a point where I like it. Um, again, I, <laughs> I know I've said this before, but this, this thing is big and it took a lot of paint. And and uh, I, it's just it, when you're just not prepared for it, it can be kind of surprising. So um, just be aware that if you ever do build this kit and paint it, it it's big. It's good. It's there's a lot of square footage on this thing that needs to get covered in paint. So um but just uh yeah just take your time um apply your thin layers here and uh it'll it'll look pretty good i think so f marine aircraft have this cool two-tone color or shade or paint job so i'm just using this uh sea gray to do the upper portion so this is gonna be all of the uh basically the horizontal surfaces on the top um and I'd considered masking it off and doing it, but uh, I figured it would, I think it would look better doing it freehand here um, and getting that softer camo edge. Um, and uh, pretty pleased with how it turned out. So again, we're just going on in, in some thin coats. Um, this, this again helps because it still allows some of that uh, light gray to show through um, and kind of create a patchwork effect. You know, again, we're going for a kind of a deployment type uh, aircraft here so uh, it's going to be out in the desert sun getting bleached and damaged and and uh, faded so not going for a perfect paint job but I, I think a fairly realistic one here um, so just kind of got to work your way around so all the upper surf all the upper flat surfaces including like the tail has has the color as well as that um, the tops of the drop tanks and the sponsons um, for the so the CH-53 has rather extensive like non-slip texture on it uh, around the helicopter for maintenance crew to get up and work on it. Um, and I've seen two versions of this where it's either really dark, like almost a black color, or this really kind of like tannish grayish color. Um, after consulting with the client, we decided to go for the, the grayish color or this tannish color. Um, and I'm, so this is a Vallejo paint and, and normally this paint is somewhat thick to begin with, but I decided to spray it at a lower pressure. And so I'm kind of getting this textured pebbly effect to it. Um, and, and I think that'll kind of help sell the, the non-slip texture, um, and really worked out, uh, how I wanted it. So we're just going around painting off all the different areas. The, the, the kit does come with decals to represent these areas, but, um, again, we, because the client wanted to go for this alternate color, 
the decals only come with the black color. I just felt this would be the better option just to mask it all off and paint it. Um, and I think I would do that anyways, even if I was doing the black color. Uh, just doing some custom codes here on the tail uh, for the client. Uh, so these were just cut out and, and masked off and painted. Um, so with all the major masking and painting done, we can kind of finish assembling some of the uh, components here, like the, the sponsons. Um, and move on to the next few stages, which is uh, weathering and decals. Um, so everything's going to get a nice layer of gloss. Uh, this will help us for our decals, help them settle down and avoid any issues like silvering, uh, as well as a base for doing a panel wash. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we just give everything a nice, good, healthy coat. This is the Alclad Aqua Gloss. Um, my this is my go-to gloss. Talked about it a lot before in previous videos, so it's pretty easy. Just spray straight out of the bottle, goes on, dries really quickly. Um, and once it fully cures in about 24 hours, it's uh, it's pretty solid. Um, so now we can do the decals. The, uh, the kit decals, this kit is, I'm not gonna say old. I mean, it's still within the last 20 years. Um, but the decals really didn't fare too well, and I had a lot of issues with them breaking. Um, and uh, so I had, to, I had to spend a fair amount of time really babying these, uh, these decals to get them to work right. Um, but the, uh, for the most part, they were fine other than that. Um, go on, and then we hit it with some solve set, let them settle down and uh, decals are good to go. There, there actually weren't terribly a lot of decals for this particular paint scheme. The kit does come with options for four different paint schemes. Um, so you do have some options and one of them is quite colorful. So just be aware that you do, got, you do have some good options. Uh, now we're gonna do our panel wash for this. I'm using the uh, blue wash for gray vehicles uh, by MIG. Um, this one kind of goes on thick, but, uh, but basically works like any other MIG washes that I've used. Um, I, I just, I, I like this color because it's not black, it's not brown, but it's just kind of this weird, weird color, <laughs> bluish color, but I think it works well on this particular vehicle. Uh, so once it's dried, we can, we can remove all the excess with a paper towel, um, for the most part, and then any of the tricky areas we will hit with some cotton buds, um, but it comes off pretty fair, fairly easily, uh, no issues. And it uh, doesn't really leave any staining. Uh, we can, you can blend it a little bit and feather it a little bit. But uh, if you really need to take it off, then um, just hit it with a little bit of enamel thinner and it's gone. So really happy with this. Like how it turned out. And uh, I think it was a good choice for, for the actual color. Um, and uh, I think it looks pretty good. So just making sure to get uh, the excess removed around some of the smaller details. Just be careful not breaking anything off. Um, but, uh, I think if I, I added some details on the kit, like these hooks on the bottom that I probably should have left off until later on in the build. And the fact that I didn't, I managed to not break those off at all during any of this was pretty impressive. Um, so with the wash done and the decals done, I'm going to hit everything with a satin varnish, um, in preparation for oils. Um, I, I, at this point in the build, I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep a satin or satin finish on it in, instead of like a full matte finish. Uh, so I was, I was still kind of deciding. So I rather, I'd rather have the satin varnish first, and then I could, I could take it down with the matte varnish later if I needed to. Um, but that's that's so that's why I chose an actual satin varnish here. Um, I also needed to paint the exhaust pipes here. I waited until the very end because I, I like to avoid putting any kind of varnishes over. Uh, the metallic paints if I can avoid that so I waited till the very end basically to the very end of the Painting process to paint these up so that I wouldn't have any Varnishes on them in order to maintain that good metallic color. So I'm just using steel uh, Vallejo steel here, and I really like how it turned out So I did the uh, so this is the third engine and then there's two engines on each side. They also get the same treatment um, Getting that that Vallejo color. So now we can do some extensive weathering with oils. Uh, again, so we're going for a nice, well weathered used aircraft here. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, wear and tear 
on the aircraft, on the upper surfaces, especially where maintenance crews are out walking on this thing and doing their their jobs. Um, a lot of fading, a lot of uh, bleaching, that kind of stuff. So uh, here I'm just using various oils and going in and just applying the oils in little batches, blending it, applying more, blending it, applying more uh, until I'm satisfied with, you know, with the look that I've I've got. So what I like to do here is because I'll be doing multiple layers, I like to start with the lightest colors first, and then I can work down into the darker colors. Um, so we're doing a lot of uh, streaking. So this is just pure white um, that I'm working on and then blending down uh, to create some streaking effects as well as you know uh, fading effects on the on the walkways and now we can start coming in with some of our darker colors so here we're just using a really dark brown uh, kind of a reddish brown um, and, and again so we're, we're I'm applying it and then blending it so I, I'm using a few different brushes here uh, a really small brush to actually do the application so I can be precise in where I'm putting it and then a large like this r large round brush that's loaded with uh, mineral spirits to help blend it and and move it around as I need to um, for the upper surfaces here I've mixed in a little bit more black with this area just to kind of create more of an oily effect here um, funny thing um, I was uh, originally told, or I was told later on by a couple of people who actually worked on these that I didn't do enough grease around the engine box or like the transmission box up there. So uh, apparently I didn't weather it enough, um, but still pretty happy with the result. Uh, just try to keep things concentrated, concentrated around where crew would be working and uh, moving about. And I really like the effect of having the dark color going over the lighter color because you can kind of help kind of bleach that or that stain that lighter color. Uh, to help the drying process here, I have my handy little desk fan. Uh, just have this uh, on hand whenever I need it to help speed up the drying process. Um, and now to kind of finish off replicating the whole idea of the rivets is I'm just using little bits of black here and kind of creating artificial rivet lines. Uh, so I, you, you can see I'm constantly rotating is because I'm looking at the other side that I had previously done uh, to make sure that I was matching up. So now I'm just blending it in. Uh, that doesn't need to be strong, um, but just really just blend this in and kind of gives the effect that there could be rivet lines there. Uh, so we do a horizontal and then we can do vertical. Um, and eventually I will go over the entire uh, helicopter like this um, it, it does take a little bit of time, kind of tedious, but, uh, you know, I, I think it helps sell the effect here. Uh, so if you've, if you've ever seen, um, a CH-53 that's been deployed for a while, one of the things you'll notice is just how heavy the exhaust staining can get. And, uh, I really wanted to try and replicate that here. Uh, so first off, I'm just, we're just using straight black oil paint right now, uh, adding it to the, um, the exhaust opening there and then what we're going to do is we're going to start building it up along the you know quote unquote rivet lines that we painted on previously um and creating this concentration of, of you know exhaust and soot and 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 dirt and grime there um and and this was fun and, and so really just, i'm just i'm kind of using like a dry brush technique almost where where i'm applying it and just blending it in um and uh yeah, there we go. So with all of the oils done, we can seal all of our oils under a coat of, I eventually decided I wanted to do a matte coat on this. Um, so we'll go ahead and get that all sealed in uh, under a nice matte coat so that it'll protect it from handling um, and, uh, and really kind of um, blend all that in together. And again, just really happy with, with the, uh, the overall effect that this has. Um, and uh, so you can see uh, also there we did we add we added that exhaust staining to the back ends of the sponsons um as well as w when you see all, you'll see it when i attach them the back ends of the f external fuel tanks as well um so at this point we can start removing masking this is always a one of those like it's terrifying but also satisfying because you know you don't want the clear parts to be ruined or, you know, you don't want paint to have seeped under there or something. But uh, so it's kind of like, it, you know, ooh, how's, how's it going to look? But um, but when it does work it, when it works good, it looks good. 
Uh, so here, just kind of slowly working around, taking off all the masking for the main canopy. Um, and now we can really just start finalizing all the, the last little bits here so we can start adding our landing gear. And um, the, the this kit's actually quite heavy. Um, and uh, so fortunately it has like this kind of beefy little landing gear, uh, which is more than enough to support the weight. I do believe you can get um, metal landing gear as an aftermarket item if you if you want. Uh, but I think this is this will uh, this works pretty good. Um, fortunately, she stays forward, so <laughs> not a tail sitter. I was a little concerned with that. Um, I ended up adding a little bit of weight to the inside prior to closing up, just as kind of a precaution um, and I'm glad I did so here we can just we're starting to add all of our remaining detail parts here so we've got the fuel tanks we've got the engines going on um, and uh, we're just we're on the home stretch here this is this is really where it starts coming together all these components have been separate for so long that it's really nice to start seeing them all getting attached and added on and um, really uh really helps kind of sell the just the scale of this i mean this thing is massive and um really busy so here we can also show some work on the rotor blade so it's got seven blades um so basically everything we do once we have to do seven times so a little tedious takes a little while but uh definitely work worth all the work so there's a number of decals that go onto the rotor blades and um just got to make sure those get all lined up properly looking good so just kind of assembly line it here and uh work my way through all the things that need to go on there um and then we can kind of dirty up the uh some of the bits on the rotors uh so there's a tail rotor here just adding a little bit of tamiya panel liner in black uh to kind of accentuate some of the details on there and uh same thing with the main rotor head so it, they were the the main rotor head here is painted in steel um and then, and then here we're just adding a little bit of dry brushing to the main rotor blades just to add a little bit of wear on them um, and uh, weather them up just a little bit. And uh, looking good. So they all just slot in like that. Um, uh, getting the uh, all the clear, like the navigation lights and beacons all painted up and added on. Um, the, the clear parts are nice. Just adding some Tamiya clear paints to them. Uh, get them all painted up and we here we have the uh, door gunners so these are these the the guns are included in the kit uh pretty basic i drilled out the gun barrels just to add a little bit of detail um and they just slot into these little pintle mounts that we installed early on in the build and uh if you if you just drop them in you can leave them to be uh somewhat movable so you can choose to position them how you want um look pretty good and then finally, we can add the uh, <clears throat> the cockpit windows here, the side windows. Uh, these are going to be done in the open position. Um, just kind of helps see inside a little bit. So the helicopter is basically done. Now we are going to work on a base for it. So here we just have some MDF board cut in a circle. And we're going to do a really simple desert base here. Um, pretty straightforward. So we're just adding on some PVA glue get it all spread around. Um, I, you, you notice I did sand it a little bit first. That just helps the glue grip to the to the smooth MDF. Now we're sprinkling on some uh, fine dirt. Uh, this is just from my backyard garden. It's gone through a sieve, so it's, it's all pretty uniform and clean. Um, and then using some playground sand, I'm just adding some areas of just, just kind of create some variation here. Uh, again, just using the PVA glue. I primed it in Rust-Oleum Red, and now I'm just hitting it with some Vallejo sand colors. Um, do a couple layers here, uh, let some of that red primer show through, and then we're gonna hit it a little, with, a little bit with an, some aged white from Vallejo. Again, just kind of just trying to be random here, and uh, just kind of slowly build that up until it looks good. And then we're gonna just add some some uh, dry grass here. So these are just little grass tufts from Army Painter. Uh, just pick these up in my local hobby shop and uh, you just dab them in a little bit of glue and then uh, apply them. Um, try to apply them randomly if you can, but uh, you know, humans are terrible at artificially creating randomness. Um, so just, you know, whatever you think looks good. Um, 
It was just kind of fun to add these little tufts just to help break things up. Uh, they come in different sizes and, and shapes. So um, now we can just finish it off by adding a black border. And uh, this is just using black craft paint. Don't use your nice expensive hobby paints for this because um, it you need a lot. And uh, yeah, once that's done, we are ready to reveal. Um, so this was a really simple base to make. It literally took me an afternoon and then I was done. So uh, very nice. And here we go. So here is the finished CH-53 by Academy. Um, like I said, this is an out-of-the-box build. It was, I mean, so so out of the box, you get a nice build. It, it is a nice kit. It's huge. Um, weighs a lot. Uh, it's, it is big. The, the rotor blades fully deployed do not fit in my largest display base or display case. Um, so just be aware of that if you want to build this and you want the rotor deployed, it is very large. Uh, I think tip of the rotor, the front, the tip of the tail at the back fully like this is like two and a half feet long. Um, and I apologize. I don't know what that is in centimeters, but, uh, it's long, it's large and, but it looks great. Um, it's, it's a really nice kit to build. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this build. Weathering it was fun. It's a, it's a big canvas for weathering and, um, really enjoyed it a lot. And, uh, the client liked it. So the, that's, that's the most important part. Um, so yeah, if, uh, if you've made it this far, thank you. And a huge shout out to my Patreons and uh, we'll see you on the next video.